thank the Lord for those testimonies. And uh, I found for years now that testimonies give me life. They stimulate life in my being. How many of you appreciate testimonies of what the Lord has done? And I feel like saying I appreciate you out there. Brother Scott, I can see the work of God in your life and feel the life of God through your life. And, uh, Brother John McNamara and his wife, uh, folks from the church, I appreciate you being here. Brother Latier, you're somebody special, although you probably don't know much about it. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, those that have been visiting different years, the Smalleys from the East, and Sister Finn, who has faithfully served the Lord for a long time, and I saw some mighty supernatural things done by Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Uh, praise the Lord. And each one of you, uh, it's not hard for me to see something special and unique in you. And... Uh, Having received the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will enhance, elevate, and transfigure our, the things we had from birth, and they will be lifted up to a higher plane. I really don't think you ever know yourself till you meet Jesus. Remember what happened when Simon Barjona met him? One of the first things Jesus said was, that's not your right name. <laughs> and audaciously renamed him right there. <laughs> and uh, how the angel came down and spoke to Gideon in the Old Testament. I preached about that last Wednesday night at Stan Smith's in River Rouge, Michigan. Uh, <laughs> as soon as the angel started talking, it seemed like the angel knew a lot more about Gideon than Gideon did. <laughs> I'm really convinced most human beings don't know themselves very well. And when you get in God, in the revelation of God, there will be included a self-revelation about you. You begin to find out who you are and what your potential is. Praise the Lord. I, uh, I'm going to open the Bible at the Gospel, the Gospels tonight. If you want to, you could open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. I just... As Brother Matt Matson spoke, and I appreciate you, Brother Matt, your certain exuberance you possess and liveliness, and uh, appreciate Brother Horrier. I feel perhaps the Lord sent him here just for me. Uh, <laughs> we understand each other in a way, and he's been able to teach me how to say a few words in Swedish. Uh, but... Uh, it ran through my mind suddenly, what does the gospel mean? Uh, means salvation from sin, doesn't it? Means human dignity, although not many in our circles would ever think along those lines. Man's true dignity is given to him in the gospels. How many like it when Jesus takes time with a beggar by the side of the road? And he's the king of the universe. Isn't he a different kind of a king? Some years ago, I was reading the words of a man who was, <clears throat> I guess he healed the sick. He was a healer. I'm not going to say who he was. When he died, a million came to his funeral, which is a little bit unusual. But in all that I read about the man, and I didn't read his whole book, but I looked in it. Somebody gave it to me, and I read it partly out of duty. But I suppose maybe the Lord brought the book into my hands just for one thing. I felt for years the Lord caused me to read a book just to get one fragment. Isn't it worthwhile? You know, to get one diamond out of the uh, Kimberlite in South Africa, you have to set six tons of blue clay to get one diamond. So you have to have a, a motivational urge to have diamonds to go to all the bother of sifting through six tons to get one diamond. And in his book, I read these words... He exhorted me, or whoever would read the book, saturate yourself with the Gospels. 
And I understand that man just read the Gospels over and over and over and over and over again. So I have, since the day I read his words, I have, in a measure, taken his advice and read the Gospels a good deal. And I think that the passage we're reading tonight, I would have read more than 100 times, I think. I think I would have read it more than 100 times. And I plan to keep on soaking in the Gospels. I'll recommend that to all of you. If anybody is open to take the challenge tonight, you know, everybody's seeking for the place of power, the locus of power, the source of power. Where is the power at? And uh, it could be somebody's here tonight to hear that. And for you, that will turn out to be a secret source and supply of power in your life and ministry. This uh, story occurs in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I was reading all three versions today, then I decided since Matthew's was much more abbreviated, I would concentrate on Mark's and Luke's, and uh, I enjoyed them both. There are some differences. It's the story that I'm talking about is found in Mark 5 and Luke 8, which is titled in the headings of my Bible, Two Miracles of Healing. Praise the Lord's name. How many in here have seen the miracles of Jesus like myself? How many of you have seen, whether it's conversions, healings? How many thank the Lord that you have seen his miracles and his power? Isn't it a privilege and an honor? There are some in the world who have never seen the Lord's manifestation or miracles or power or works. They feel he doesn't exist. We have seen and experienced his uh, interventions, and we know that God exists because we have experienced it. Hallelujah. Now, I want to look into the Mark and account, chapter 5 now. And there, I think there is a, let me see, a, a 23 verse section in these two miracles, which is, has to do with the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter. But before that happens, there's a 20-verse section which has to do with the demoniac of Gerasa, Gadara, or what the place is called, really, Gergesa. The demoniac, Jesus Christ comes. And there is a, a very interesting narrative here of confrontation and movement. I was impressed today that Jesus Christ's presence means automatic judgment. That his mere being in a situation causes things to surface. Uh, as I read the story of the demoniac, it had far more meaning to me today than it ever did before. I don't know why. I'm not going to preach on it. I'm talking about it for a reason, I, so I can make one statement and then enter into the other part of the gospel narrative. But I see... Uh, this tremendous movement that is uh, uh, instigated by Jesus coming, by his presence. We see demons going out of a man. We see swine running down a steep slope, 2,000 of them, I think it says in Mark's, yes, in Mark's account it says 2,000. We see a lot of people then coming out of the city or village to see Jesus. And the, the terms of Jesus' presence are so staggering, they, can't, they cannot assimilate it, and they invite him to leave. Now, he, Stanley Jones, makes a remark about this in one of his devotionals. Isn't it interesting? They were able to coexist with one of the choicest demoniacs who ever existed. He, he could be there for a whole human generation and they could live side by side with him. But when the Son of God walks in, suddenly they cannot endure his being there. They cannot assimilate his works and his presence. Stanley Jones said they had become naturalized to the unnatural. They could live with demons that they did not think at first that they could live with Jesus. 
But as all this movement, as soon as he comes, things are moving. One of the fascinating insights that I have seen is when the time was that Jesus Christ was born of the virgin and came into the world, there was Israel in their state of being. They were the way they were. They had the scriptures, they had the scrolls, they had the traditions, they had the law, they had the prophets, they had the sacred history, the salvation history, which is a very special kind of history. They had many, many, many religious experts who knew, I suppose, more than any of the Christians have ever known in any churches I've been in. Our churches, frankly, have been notable for ignorance. I was arguing with the Jehovah's Witness leader on my, the streets of my hometown about 29 years ago. He was a little feisty man, a little short and feisty. The former leader I had known, he was shaped like Tom Worth, and he was a very lovely man. He was my grand, his father and my grandfather were personal friends. But this man that came as a leader, he was a little bulldog of a man. And he and I talked, and I refuted him on a few points. I, not by intelligent, by grace, I would say, by the Holy Ghost and by dumb luck, you know, by, or just the Lord. And he would get so mad he'd walk in a circle right in front of me. But he did give me a good thrust. He said, why, your people don't even know their own doctrine. When he said it, I knew he was right. <laughs> that uh, we need to learn more of the divine knowledge. Can you say amen tonight? We need to be students of the word and we need to read the scriptures and Find out what verses mean and not be botched for a lifetime and thinking that when it says we're peculiar people that we're somehow odd <laughs> means we belong peculiarly to God. That's what it means. <laughs> he owns us. That's what that doesn't mean what the word degenerated into mean and to mean in popular life. We need to master those things. I, I'm not like Brother uh, uh, Kerwin, who was here, who was wanting to get a lot of things sorted out. I've never done that to congregate. Get it sorted out. But there are a few things we need to learn and master that and get over that hurdle. Amen. Get out into clear and get the hobbles off and get the burdens off and get free. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And there was Israel when, when Jesus came and there was the written word and nothing was happening. Four centuries since any manifest glory had been seen or known or felt. Four centuries since any fresh rhema flowing prophecy had flowed in that uh, religious people. Four centuries since there had been any real insight on the part of the high priest. A long period of dryness and darkness and lack of manifestation. And then there came someone... Let me read what the Bible says about him. And the word was made flesh. E. Stanley Jones said, this is the central verse in the Bible. I think I could just about agree with him. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when he walked in the incarnate word, the word in a flesh form, he started his ministry. It didn't take many days to have something verging on a riot taking place. I mean, the nation began to jump and dance and vibrate with, with, with interest and anxieties on the part of certain religious experts. And the multitudes were suddenly in motion. I'm fascinated when the masses of the earth begin to move. I'm fascinated with the folk wandering period when all those people in Asia suddenly pulled their tent stakes up one day, rolled their tents, and started moving toward Europe. Why did they do it? I don't know. It had to be the Holy Ghost somehow in there, I think. And I like to picture myself soaring over, over the, the Judean desert in the days of John the Baptizer and peering down like a, like a soaring eagle and seeing those hundreds of thousands suddenly 
coming out of their houses one day, moving down the streets, going right out to the city gate and beginning to trek out through the desert where it was very inconvenient and dry and dangerous to hear a man called John the Baptizer who had a very unflattering message and, and, and practically had only one string in his harp and he harped and harped and harped and harped on repentance. We couldn't be in the ministry today on those terms. They would say, you either get a new sermon or get out of here. And then the whole era started with him, John, whose name essentially means grace. Jehochanan, <laughs> the gracious gift of Jehovah. Glory, 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 glory that the word plunged into the earth, hallelujah, robed himself in human flesh and walked the earth an incomparable figure, a matchless figure as the inspired hymn writer said tonight and the words we saw flashed upon the silver screen and he walked and he did things that no man ever did and he said words that, that astounded uh, both the genius and common folk and when they went to capture him once he said a few words and they went back uh, nonplussed and all they could say to the leaders was never a man spake like this man <laughs> and they said what are you also his disciples he's the kind who readily converts his enemies How many want to know more about Jesus? <laughs> what is, there's an old evangelical song, more about Jesus, what I know, more of his saving fullness. Some have got the words wrong, but we used to sing it in the UB church back in the 40s. And so when we look in the Bible at any and all these stories, let us remember the revelatory fact. We're looking at the word made flesh. I believe there has been a generation or two of influence that has causing, caused us to perhaps overhumanize Jesus. I found him talking to Brother Parkins, that's one of his pet peeves. And I just saw some pointed criticism of one of the great faith leaders in the Midwest. They say it appears from analysis that he has a finite God. Well, I serve an infinite, uncreated God. I'm not, I had a period in my life when I was interested to bring God down to my size, to get him down to my level, sort of shrink him and get him in a manageable shape and size. But I, I'm, I'm now willing to let him be transcendent. Let him be infinite. Let him be above everything. Let him be uh, who and what he is. And let him raise me. <laughs> I read today in, 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 in Ezra, uh, to do a divine work, it says God looked upon a man and it says God raised his spirit. I, I now know that you can't do anything unless God Almighty puts his redeeming hand under you and raises your spirit. I now know you cannot preach that all men are like Ezekiel. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. I can't preach this gospel. I can't declare this message. I am fraught with inability. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth and my soul clings to the dust as the writer of Psalm 190. But God can get underneath with the everlasting arms and he can raise my spirit. And it's the raised spirit that serves the Lord. It's the raised spirit that is a functional element of the body of Christ. It is the raised spirit that has thrown away the old Adamic senses and God has given us a whole new set of senses which are none other than the gifts of the spirit. But I just noticed... These elements in the, the, the demonia. I'm not preaching on him tonight. I'm just, I'm just referring to it. I'm just directing your attention to a, a biblical passage. The demons moved. The swine moved. The people moved. And the healed man, he wanted to leave there. No wonder. The one that just healed him isn't welcome there. I suppose he felt alienated and not only did he want to go because he liked Jesus a lot, but perhaps he, he didn't feel comfortable in his old setting anymore. And, and the day before this, he was the bad one and they were all the good ones. And all of a sudden, they've turned bad and he's now been transformed by... He's good. Too bad they couldn't have stayed good and he got good and the whole bunch have been good together and <laughs> served the real and living God and built a church of 15,000, 25,000 members there. 
taken up offerings and paid the swine farmer for the damage and said, Jesus, even though it's costly to have you come in, we want you to come anyway. We're willing to stand the damage. How many know Jesus coming may cost us something? Just think how many nice Chinese dishes we could have made with those swine crates. 2,000, 200 pound hogs, I tell you. That's a lot of delectation in the oriental manner when they use pork better than anybody does. <laughs> Our pork dishes are crude and theirs are refined. But there isn't going to be any because Jesus came. <laughs> yeah, there's more than just blessing when Jesus comes. There's a price to pay, yeah. like the old timers preached. And I'm not making the price substitute for the death on Calvary. The death on Calvary is there and because it's there, the price gets steeper. But had he not, we'll see. But what I want to say is the whole upshot is the man says, uh, he, he implored him, he begged, Jesus, let me go with you. Let me be in your evangelistic team. Let me be one of the party. I've got a, I've got a testimony that will set the crowd on fire. Why, they'll have me at Madison Square Garden, and I'll set the stage for you, Jesus, when they hear what you've done. Why, the whole city will probably repent. Howbeit Jesus permitted him not. He doesn't always do what you would expect him. Why, certainly, having done what I did, how could I deny any request of thine? Howbeit Jesus permitted him not. There is a set of divine no's that are spoken as well as divine yeses. God told me several years ago, be sensitive to my no's. The no's, the negatives in the will of God. But Jesus saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them what great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And the man departed and began to publish in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. See, the good news has got into a, a, an accommod, uh, into a form that we can receive. A man just like us, where they couldn't receive Jesus himself, they are receiving the man. And he is a forerunner for Jesus in the gospel. And he preaches to them what I would call an abbreviated personal gospel. And God's saying to that city, in this man you're seeing a sample of what I'm going to do on a cosmic scale. And that man was, as it were, a key to unlock the door. And we know that there was a great deal of conversion through the apostles in this very area. These ten cities, as it were, got converted just, oh, maybe 15, 20, 25 years down the road, this whole section turns to the Lord. There's great revival, great evangelism in this section. And this is the man who was Jesus' advance agent. You see the gospel there at the end of that gospel story. It it's almost epitomizes the gospel itself. The Bible says in the Lucan form, I'm reading what Luke, the way Luke puts those same two verses. <clears throat> Jesus sent him away saying, Return to thine own house and show what great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass, well, that's what Luke has to say. My mother was telling me some months ago, my stepfather's name is Condon. So Ray Condon is his name. And at the brickyard where we all worked, there was a man called Jim Condon, whom I never really knew well. I, I think I... He was a bare acquaintance of mine, but he had emphysema. And he developed emphysema to a, a very great extreme until Jim Conn had to live off oxygen tanks up in a little country crossroads town about as big as Salisbury Center called, I think, Olanta. A little lady we used to know about four foot ten called Katie Mayhew said to my mother one day, you know, Jim Condon is terrifically suffering with emphysema. And Katie knew my mother was healed by Jesus and 
She said, why don't you go up there and talk to him and pray for him? So my mother went up one evening and talked to Jim Condon about Jesus, the fact that he saves the soul and heals the body, the very simple bare gospel proclamation, which is very important as the kerugma. And Jim Condon just accepted the whole thing without reservation. My mother laid hands on and prayed, and quite often in those days my mother's hands would flow with supernatural oil when she prayed for the sick. Happened many, 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 many times. My mother said two weeks later she was on the streets of our hometown, which was called Clearfield, Pennsylvania, because there had been a clear field when the white men first came, and buffalo grazed there. This whole world land once swarmed with great buffalo. They saw a herd once that had two billion crossing a railroad out west. Two billion animals in one herd, calculated by educated men. And there were a man across the street hailed my mother and said, Mrs. Condon, do you know me? My mother went up to him and he said, do you know who I am? She said, I can't say as I do. <laughs> he said, I'm Jim Condon. <laughs> I'm healed. <laughs> Left the oxygen tanks off. Uh, total freedom came into his respiratory system. An absolute stroke by this same man we're reading about tonight. His name is Jesus. He is the healer of all diseases. Glory, glory, glory. I said he is the healer of all diseases. He is the king. He is not only the king, he's the king of kings. He's not only the king of kings, he's the king of the kings of the kings. <laughs> And I was standing over in that yellow classroom about seven or eight years ago, and I saw this. For years and years, I saw Jesus, the king of all the beautiful things in the cosmos, king of the stars, king of the angels, king of all children, king of the flowers, king of the mountains. And God said to me somehow that day, not in an audible voice, which I'm not even looking for, because the Holy Ghost lives inside of me. I'm fascinated with the fact of the divine indwelling. What possibilities... That brings into view when we know that God Almighty has moved into our beings. We have to listen to sermons and teens for years to get that through our heads. <laughs> and somehow, I don't know how, God said to me, I'm not only the king of beautiful things, I'm the king of ugly things too. I'm the king of cancer. The king of hell. King of heart attacks. King of paralysis. He's the king of everything. He's the king of the whole ugly half of the world as well as the beautiful half. He's the king of demons. Why, these demons treated him like a king this day. They came as uh, uh, obedient subjects. They begged of him. They, they showed a full measure of apprehension of his sovereignty. And they did what he said. <laughs> Oh, I'm impressed in Mark's gospel where it says in one of the translations, I read almost 20 translations, and how when he came into the world, the Jewish religious experts were not able to identify Jehovah in the flesh. But the Bible says in one man's translation, the demons knew him intuitively. <laughs> now what irony, the religious expert cannot identify who he is, and every demon knew. What a disadvantage it is to be a man sometimes. And to be an educated religious expert. I'm trying to press on into these two miracles of healing. <laughs> I'm moving. I'm pressing through the story break here. But the Bible says the, the end result of that wonderful act of Jesus was, and all men did marvel. Do you see that everlasting repetition of human response to his miracles, astonishment. He performs in John's Gospel the Samea Kaiterata, signs and wonders, and their result is always human astonishment. It was the astonishment with which the signs and wonders smote me that caused me to begin to follow him years ago. He persuaded me by power. I was too coarse to be reached by love. I can only dimly apprehend its vibrating waves, but its power I could see plainly before my eyes as a scientific observer. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. You know, friends, sitting here tonight, Jesus has exciting things in your future. If you only believe. Hallelujah. Now, I'd like to talk. How many want to praise? Can we lift our hands? Brother, brother, uh, brother Roundtree says, lift your hands. We can lift our hands and praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Praise the name of Jesus. 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 Name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We do praise thee. We do magnify thee. We do exalt thee. We lift thee up. We magnify thy name. We sanctify thy name. We proclaim thy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to look at these two miracles of healing and share three or four little things the Lord gave me today. I've been looking at it for years and years. I suppose I preached on the woman once in my life, maybe twice. Maybe more than I forgot about it. I would talk about her when I talk about the touch of Jesus. How many know it's highly significant to be touched by Jesus? That woman, that Jamaican woman who wrote to chorus had a point. Touching Jesus is all that really matters. And your life will never be the same. There is only one way to touch him. Just believe when you call on his name. That's obviously a product of the great Wesleyan movement. But it's sweet, isn't it? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Verse 21 of Mark chapter 5, which is our proper beginning after some introductory remarks from the other story. And when Jesus was passed over again by boat unto the other side, many people gathered unto him, and he was near unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Luke has one word that is very, very touching. Luke says he had one only daughter. Do you see the, the divine way of gathering up preciousness in the whole idea of him having a little girl, one only daughter? I want to approach that from a certain standpoint tonight. When you look in the New Testament, which I have before me, a King James modified version, New, King, uh, New Schofield with a modified King James text, I see J-I-R-U-S, which is the Latin form of his name. The Greek would have it similar to that, ending with an O-S instead of a U-S, and would be pronounced Iairos. And if you look in the concordance, it'll tell you it's a Greek form of a Hebrew Old Testament name, and there were four Israelites by this name. And that word, or the whole origin and root of his name, which in Hebrew is Yair, gathers up in it practically every idea about light that there is. His name, Yairos, what, I don't know if he would have used the Greek form, uh, probably being Aramaic, he wouldn't have. Maybe they still called him Yair, but it gathers up, it, it really means either the enlightener or the, the, or he enlightens, Maybe it can mean the enlightened one, but the root of his name gathers up within it every connotation of light you can imagine. Radiance. Oh. Illumination. Being set on fire. Even uh, the east takes its name from this same root as a source of light. And even the breastplate of the high priest, the Urim, is a plural form from the very root that this man's name comes from, the lights and perfections of the high priest's sparkling stones in his breastplate, which lights ceased to flicker about four centuries before Jesus came into the world. That's a fact you can discover reading 
historical analysis, Josephus, etc. Can you imagine the irony? You know, some men in the Bible are named with what I call ironic names. Like Gideon, I preached on him uh, a week and a day ago out in Michigan. His name means <clears throat> the destroyer. And the Bible story says, Tim and little Gideon was hiding in the wine press, threshing wheat to hide it from all those eastern enemies of Israel. The main motivating factor of his life was fear and anxiety. And he bears the ironic name, the destroyer. He's more like the destroyed. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord comes down. And amazingly, when heaven talks, the throne talks, remember the angel only bears the very thoughts of the personal transcendence that exists up above all this. And when the angel opens his mouth and begins to speak, it, re it is revealed that destroyer was what heaven had in mind all the time. And the angel says, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And God has to patiently argue with him through a better part of a chapter to get Gideon to believe that he is what he was called. He said, he much as if I've been mislabeled in life. Acts that were performed with men with names like mine happened in the old days. And our fathers tell them as ancient tales to us. But there's no man today with that kind of anointing power experience. We're puny pygmies. We're pale reflections of the Israelite that was that came in and conquered this land. Now we have fallen through sin or backsliding or unbelief or weakness. We're a, we're a fallen race. And my name is just a joke. And he says, no, I'm going to give you grace. I will be with thee. <laughs> Glory be to God. Oh, I, I made a little formula last week. When God is with the least, the least becomes greater than the greatest. <laughs> why God got so uh, wound up there, he says, why Gideon, thou shalt smite them as one man. <laughs> See, God cannot exaggerate concerning his own abilities. <laughs> and as one preacher was preaching and something I was reading, we have one emotion that God cannot feel, that's fear. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Being named with an ironical name. Here is this man. His name bristles with every connotation of light, radiance, illumination, fire, glory. Living in a nation dominated by the Roman Empire. Living under the shadow. Having heroes in the Old Testament. And I, I just noted the four down here on a piece of paper for us tonight. Let's see the four mighty heroes of faith called Yair in the Old Testament. Open with me if you care or just listen while I look at Numbers chapter 32. I will advert briefly to these four. Numbers chapter 32 and verse... Forty, forty-one and forty-two. Numbers thirty-two, forty. Moses gave Gilead unto Machir the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt therein. And Jair or Yair the son of Manasseh went and took the small towns thereof and called them Havoth Yair, which can be interpreted as something like the lighted dwellings. It's interesting. The word Havoth means life, and Yair means light. It almost can be interpreted life. Through light. In other words, this Jair was one of the leading warriors in the conquest of Gilead by Moses himself. He was a leading warrior used by God. That's the first reference. Then there was a judge called by this man's name. The same name that Jairus bore later. This is found in Judges 10, 3, and 4. <clears throat> and it's titled here, Jair, the eighth judge. Verse 3 of Judges 10 says, And after him rose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. 
And he had thirty sons who rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. One of the mighty judges who had the gift of the Holy Ghost bore the name Jair. And then we'll find a reference to another one who has two different names, but one of his name is Jair. That's in 2 Samuel 21. <clears throat> 2 Samuel 21, 19. Listen to what this Jair did. 2 Samuel 21, 19. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of Jari Oregim, and in the mar margin it says his name was also Jair, where he, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. This Jair slew a giant single-handedly. Single-handed. Number four is found in Esther chapter two and verse number five. How many can praise the Lord for the Bible, for his word, and for the edification and the in stimulation that it gives us? Esther chapter 2 and verse 5. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shima, Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. So Mordecai's dad had that same name. Four heroes in the Old Testament who are possessors of what we would call bright fame. And here's this poor, victimized Jair who lives under the shadow of Roman domination with not a flicker of hope that he could be a mighty warrior deliverer like the ones that bore his name in the Old Testament. He's number five. <laughs> He's number five. But you know, there came into his life a light. He had a little girl. How many know that the birth of a baby is like a new star coming into being? That little girl lighted up his life even though he lived under the shadow of Rome's dominion. And no doubt went a long ways towards making up for all the lack in his life. And then one day, the ultimate darkness called death stalked his house and laid its clammy hand upon his beloved little daughter, and the last light threatened to go out. <clears throat> but you notice what Jairus did? Jairus went to Jesus. Jairus went to Jesus. I said Jairus went to Jesus in his extremity. Isn't that wise? Isn't that the one piece of light you really need? It's like the little flashlight that can lead you out of your cave into the bright sunlight. Just knowing that you've got to get to Jesus at any cost. And I remember two New Testament scriptures that somewhat apply to Jairus at this time. They're well-known ones, and I want to refer to them with you tonight as we go on praising the name of Jesus. That's what the theme of this service is, praising Jesus' name tonight and lifting it up. I want to look into the Gospel of John, chapter 3, first of all. I marked out this scripture. John 3, 19, 20, and 21. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. I see Jairus here coming to Jesus a light that there might be a true manifestation in his house and see whether this death is truly an irresistible figure, an inexorable force. Something that nothing can grapple with. Or could it possibly be the disfigure who is being, uh, whose fame is going through the land? Jesus, perhaps he could grapple with this figure called death. Hallelujah. Jairus 
under the shadow of the Roman Empire and under the very dense shadow of death, does the best thing. He, he comes to Jesus, who is the light. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the light. There's another scripture. Another scripture that I marked here that came to my thinking as I was reading the gospel story. Ephesians 5.13 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatever doth make manifest is light. You see, when Jesus is through with this episode, there is going to have been a manifestation in Jairus' house. Something is going to come to the light. There's going to be a revelation that most people have never dreamed of. Namely, that death is not irresistible. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Oh, don't you feel like shouting when you consider the whole idea of resurrection? That I'm coming out of the ground in a future age. That we will be getting up out of the earth and we will look upon each other and we will see each other in an age to come having been through the experience of death never to die again because Jesus Christ has raised us personally from the dead. I was preaching last year. I had, had a little insight. It was a, a stimulating thought, a, an inspiring thought that I, could, I can suffer my whole lifetime. I can have 70 years of unrelieved suffering. Everything can go wrong. I may never have a, a nice car or a mansion to live in. I may never be able to put good things in my mouth like a rare New York strip steak or uh, uh, anything you might dream of that one would really crave to eat. Well, I may lose, I may miss the whole scene. I, I may uh, have missed having a nice girlfriend or a nice wife, but the Lord did give me a marvelous... But you can miss everything, lose just everything. Never have a profession, never have fame, never make any money. Just be a total blank as far as this life goes. And if Jesus Christ will get you up out of the ground and make you immortal, you will be more than compensated in one stroke for a whole lifetime of suffering. Just knowing you're, up, you're out of the ground. You're not dependent upon food anymore. Not dependent upon the natural processes. Instead of a victim, you're a master. And you're, you're something like a reflection of him himself. <laughs> a manifested son after having been a manifested wretch for an entire 70 years. I tell you, oh God trades silver for gold. Glory be to God. <laughs> Oh, the gospel offer, is it not a wonder that if you wouldn't have a crowd in New York City and as soon as you'd be in the mention today would storm the altar, say, give us this. Why, the woman at the well of Samaria, as soon as she saw and began to understand, she, he says, evermore give me this water <laughs> that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Oh, there's good news in the gospel tonight because there's a figure called Jesus who possesses in his body, in his being, all power, all authority. He's the one. That, and it says, Jairus fell at his feet. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. The four Jairuses in the Old Testament were heroes of accomplishment. Jairus' victories are all going to be by another. And that's the essence of grace. Oh, Paul says, when I'm weak, then am I strong. Hallelujah. This man, Jairus, with the last energies of his being, uh, his life almost expiring with misery, knowing his little girl is going to die, he falls at Jesus' feet. He said, Jesus, please come to my house. And they all set off together, a whole crowd of people on their way to Jairus' house. Then there's a, an interlude here, a new paragraph beginning at verse number 43 in my Bible. It says, And a woman, having an issue of blood twelve years, who had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by any. And Luke says, suffered, rather, Mark says, let me go back to Mark's form. Mark says, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had. Basically reading from the Markin account tonight. I'm back in Mark 5, 27. <clears throat> when
when she had heard of Jesus, came in the crowd behind him and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be well. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? <laughs> Evidently there are, there's a touch, and then there's another kind of a touch. A touch that is a willed touch. A touch that's full of hunger and desire. A touch that knows what it wants. A touch that just doesn't jostle him like one other person in the crowd, but somehow plugs into the very dynamo of his irresistible love and power. She knew it, and he knew it. Peter denied it, but they knew it. I want to preach this idea to you. The God we serve is a God who will be interrupted. Why? There's somebody dying over there. We're, we're on a crisis uh, errand. We've got to put everything aside and get over to Jairus' house as quickly as possible. You know, I marvel time and again at this Bible God, this great potentate, this great universal uh, Ruler, how when you meet him, he's not arrogant like men. He's not fussy. He's not concerned about the decorum all that much. But he's willing for the structure to be all broken up and shattered because of a, of a, uh, a poor suffering soul who's seeking him. He's interruptible. He's pro approachable. He's touchable. He'll communicate with you. If you're doing it in faith and repentance, you won't get a rebuke. You'll hear the sweetest sound human ear ever heard. Divine forgiveness and healing and making whole. Think of the interruptions in the Bible. Blind Bartimaeus shrieking by the roadside. A whole big mass of humanity raising a big dust cloud. A tremendous social force. They're all going somewhere and Jesus is there. And this poor character shrieks like a wounded animal. And Jesus stops. And the impersonal, heartless crowd says, does everything in his power to quiet Bartimaeus. But he raises his voice still more. He converts their negative energy into positive energy. And his voice comes to Jesus with still more insistence. And the Bible says, Jesus stands still. There was a classic sermon in the 50s preached by Walter Kronberg called The Man Who Arrested God. <laughs> Human need expressed with the whole heart arrests our God. Human need. I tell you, I am fascinated with the stories of answered prayer where a needy person cried to the throne and the throne responded in all, in all kind of earthly circumstances. I think one of the most fascinating in our time is one that happened to William Branham back in the earlier, middle or late 50s. It happened in Memphis, Tennessee. He was coming from somewhere from one of those either tent crusades or auditorium or arenas and he was flying home to his home in Indiana and he happened to be in Memphis and stayed in a hotel overnight and get up at about 7 in the morning, had a letter or two to mail, had a plane to catch at around 9, I think. Came down out of the hotel and <clears throat> Brandon was one of those men that always get up early. He was always harping at Billy Paul, his boy, for sleeping in bed too, too late in the morning. Brother Brandon was a wisdom and he always got up early like a lot of the old timers and Came down with his letters, and then he dropped them in the box, and when he did, a voice spoke to him and said, just keep on going. And he was on a main drag in Memphis, and he obeyed the voice. He started to walk. He was a man who'd walked a lot in his life. He walked for several hours. He walked for scores of blocks, probably walked for 100 to 200 blocks. And the voice would repeat itself, just keep on going. Just keep on going. Just keep on going. And he walked way out to the edge of the city where the houses were smaller and more humble and there were some little white picket fences and as he came along there were, 
he came to a certain little domicile where there was <clears throat> where the large black lady leaning on the fence out at the front, just like this. And he noticed when he looked at her, there was dew on her hair. And when he got up to her, Branham said, Morning, Auntie. And she said, Morning, Parson. And he said, Then the Spirit of the Lord moved over his heart. And she began to speak. And she said, I have been standing here since 2 o'clock this morning. For I was in prayer. And the Lord said to me, And her son, 18 years old, inside a great big boy, 200 and some pounds, was in a delirium from a disease he had that affected his brain. And he was having an endless vision of being tossed on a black ocean full of storm. And he was groaning and declaring his, the imagery in, in his inward being, in agony, throwing himself all over the bed. And his mother prayed in great desperation at night, and the Lord spoke and said, I'm going to send my servant, William Branham, and your son is going to be healed. And she went out and stood at the gate, and it stood since two in the morning, and was covered with dew. So Branham went in the gate, and they went in the house together, and in the bedroom, and Branham saw this rather terrible sight. And they got down on their knees, and he said, you pray first, auntie. And Branham said, she prayed a prayer that brought all heaven to its feet. And when she got done praying, that mighty gift went into operation. And he said some words or touched him or something, but the power and authority of Jesus Christ operated in that obscure little white house in Memphis, Tennessee. And a miracle of God was done. Because somebody had cried with a quality that touched and shook the throne. Jesus said, nevertheless, when a son of man cometh, will he find faith in the earth? Will he find a faith that can affect the cosmos? Will he find a faith that reaches up and lays hold of the throne of God and shakes it? And Branham walked back. Maybe he took a taxi. I presume he walked, being a woodsman said to himself, well, my plane's gone now. See, miracles can cost. <laughs> you know what he found out? There had been a snowstorm up north and all the planes were kept on the ground. God Almighty began to twist all the knobs of the cosmos for the sake of that woman. <laughs> How many are glad we have a God who can be interrupted? Who's approachable? Isaiah in the throne room. Can you imagine going to the seraph worship service? Who worships like a seraph? Uncountable numbers of seraphim and three choirs engaged in divine worship. Shh. Isaiah screams in the midst of it all. Seraph suddenly falls silent. Isaiah has sins that need to be de dealt with. Seraph goes and gets a pair of tongs and gets something too hot for even angels to handle while Isaiah interrupts the heavenly worship service. Does God rebuke him? God blesses him, takes his sins away, gives him a call and a commission and a revelation and a gift and a mouth that will talk like no man that will ever walk the earth. He interrupted right in heaven. Because there was a pressing need. <clears throat> Jesus said, who touched my clothes? <laughs> you know, if we said it, we'd be just fussy. Jesus says it with a deeper purpose in mind. His disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude crowded thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? Jesus, you're unreasonable. And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. He said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee well. Go in peace and be well of thy plague. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The interruptible God. Glory to God. Now let us go on with our gospel story. Verse 35. While he yet spoke, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain who said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? 
Isn't that? You know, we had a lot of deaths in my family years ago. <clears throat> and the announcement usually came by the phone ringing at about six in the morning. And I learned to dread the phone bell at six in the morning because there would be on the, on the wire the, the, either the word dead or death. And it was a stunning blow just to wake up in the morning and hear that your aunt had died, your uncle, your grandmother, your grandfather, somebody like that. And they come to the house and the word hits his ear. Your daughter is dead. For human beings, that's the limit. That's the end. That's the farthest out boundary line we can move to. But I want to preach Jesus Christ as the Christ who trespasses beyond human limitations. The great modern philosophers talk much about boundary experiences. Jairus and everybody would have stopped right there and made all different arrangements for a funeral. Jesus says, as soon as Jesus heard the word was spoken, he saith unto the rule of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. You know, I notice in the Gospels, Jesus tests death three times before he lets himself fall into the power of death. I almost see it as two wrestlers coming out in the ring. And the first way you ever get to test your opponent's strength is his grip. We come out to the center of the rip and we clasp hands and we both squeeze. And I tell you, two men put pressure on their grips that isn't long before they both know who's the stronger. stronger. And so I see these three cases. Who were they in the Gospels? Who all was resuscitated or resurrected in the Gospels? Who? Lazarus, the widow's son, the widow's son and the little 12-year-old girl, <clears throat> the little damsel. And three times I see Jesus going to his adversary death and testing him. <laughs> when I was working on the shipping dock of General Motors in the west edge of Detroit at Telegraph Road, one man who came in as an outsider was a real character. He was Big Slim Ludwig was his name. He was about this tall. He weighed 285. He was a World War II sergeant. He was a big German who made his own sauerkraut and sold it and butchered animals and also drove truck. And we've seen Big Slim flash out $6,000 of bills he'd picked up in his deliveries. He had a voice that could be heard hundreds of feet in our factory. He talked something like this when he talked to you. He wore bib overalls, a blue wool cardigan, and a one of those flat hats. I think, I forget what they call that flat kind of a hat, the old timers. He had a big quid of tobacco in his face. And... He had gigantic hands, and he used to like to come up and poke us. He would come up when he talked, and he would go like this on you with his two fingers. I saw him do it to Larry Jacoboni in the West Dock, and he was a bony, slim person, and Big Slim hurt him. He wrapped on his ribs. I remember the day Big Slim did it to me. I contracted my pectoral muscles, and he went like this, and he said, oh. <laughs> but he was a good man. He was a truly good kind of a human being. He won the Irish sweepstakes, by the way, 120000 with his two nephews one year. He got so mad, the tax man was at his door right away. He was mad. And Big Slim's wife owned a beauty shop, and Big Slim made lots of money. But he was a kind and generous and compassionate man. And he said to us, <clears throat> when I was about 18, I used to go to the pool hall, and he said, in those days I moved pianos. He said I was very strong. And he said there was a bully there, about 30, that had taken all the men and hurt their hands. They had locked hands and squeezed, and this bully had hurt everybody around the pool hall. And Big Slim said, I was waiting for him to pick me someday. <laughs> and he said, sure enough, the day came. He said, the bully came after me. He said, I knew I was stronger than he. He wouldn't have said it like I did. He was a little bit crude, but he said, we locked hands. He said, I begin to put the pressure on. And he said, I got him down to his knees. And I said, there, how do you like it? How do you like it? He said, I punished him. I revenged all the other men whose hands he had hurt. <laughs> Those are his very words I report to you. He had a very large and oppressive and beautifully shaped hand. And even at 60, he was still a very formidable man. He was a very manly kind of a man, right to the core. 
And I see Jesus going in to test death. I see Jesus Christ as the trespasser of human limits. I see the one who dares to go beyond the old taboos. I see him as transgressing that ultimate boundary called death. He dares to put his foot on the other side of it. Hallelujah. He is truly the incomparable Christ. Hallelujah. He is going to match himself with man's ancient enemy. Paul says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe, only have faith. Keep your confidence, Jairus. And he permitted no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, who and seeth the tumult, and those who wept and wailed greatly. When he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The child is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Look what Luke says. You won't need a turn, but if you can, if you want to, the Lucan story. Luke eight fifty two. They all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Look what Luke adds, knowing that she was dead. They knew real facts. What they knew, in, in a manner of speaking, was the truth. According to us humans, she was dead. Her pulse had stopped. Her breath no longer coursed in and out through her mouth and nose and Jesus comes into the situation and pits his personal truth against facts I, I God has made me aware of how many times Jesus dares to leap into an arena of conflict and pit his personal truth against obvious cosmic, stubborn, concrete facts, historical, that every human being has to agree to, but Jesus as a truth confronts them hostilely and begins to grapple with them. They knew she was dead, but he knew he was the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I'm fascinated with this Re repeated action of Jesus or God all through the Bible where there's a terrible blank granite wall of facts staring in the face. You know what Lenin said, the genius? Facts are stubborn things. Jesus comes into the death chamber and confronts the stubborn fact of death. They laughed him to scorn. <laughs> I want you to notice... One moment they were weeping and wailing, and all of a sudden it changed to laughter just like that. <clears throat> Let me say that Jesus' presence exposes social hypocrisy. You see all of these side effects. When Jesus just doesn't get that main course on the table. He brings in a lot of other surprising things with it. They were all exposed. They laughed at him, but he commanded them. He put them out, it says. He taketh the father and the mother of the child and those who are with him, that's his three disciples already named, and entereth in where the child was lying. And he took the child by the hand and saith unto her, and I think he said it this way in his original language, I think it went like this, Talitha kum. His original words were very close to what I have just pronounced to you. How many would have liked to have been there and heard Jesus speak those words to the little girl? Wouldn't it be nice to hear his actual voice, feel the touch of his hand as we will in the age to come? Which is being interpreted, little girl, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the child arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. 
And then I find Jesus' final words very striking to me. And he charged them strictly that no man should know it. You know, one of the chief features of the revival of the last 40-year period, we have tremendously advertised miracles. And we said quite bluntly in the 50s and 60s, of course I learned it from older men, we will use miracles as a drawing card to draw the multitudes. We found that healing was a fantastic drawing card to draw crowds. But I have become aware of this gospel reversal where Jesus charges them strictly that no man should know it. There's another price. Are you, are you ready to have the supernatural come into your life in a truly real and dynamic way and have the discipline to keep your mouth shut the way the Father himself wills it? God restricted the transfiguration viewing to three men by his own sovereign inscrutable purpose perhaps we could rave against the affront to democracy and egalitarianism and all that but I want to know this God and I want to be in his power and I want to learn what I've got to do to have it to obey him and then how practical the Christ is and commanded that something should be given her to eat we don't eat in church. <laughs> How delightfully unreligious Jesus is at times. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Theology's in order now. But the little girl's hungry. Give her something to eat. How many like Jesus? Isn't he nice? You know. I don't, how he could come down from that high plateau where he has grappled with death. And where unseen things went on that the eye of Peter, James, and John could not discern. Where he penetrated beyond man's limits. He went in the death chamber to kill death. In John Donne's great poem, I thought of getting it reading, but it's maybe too indicate. It's called Death Be Not Proud. In the last line, John Donne waxes almost ecstatic and cries, Death, thou shalt die. You and I will live to see the death of death. And we will be astonished with a great astonishment. Hallelujah. God bless you all. In the name of Jesus.